1991, a fellow's driving one night after a night of drinking, watching ball games with his buddy, when uh, he sees the blue lights. This fellow happened to be African American and he had had some run-ins with the law before and he did something he shouldn't have, he took off. He began to speed away. The police began in a high-speed chase until finally they were able to get him, pull him out of the car to which they began to beat him kind of brutally. Someone happened to be standing on their balcony with a recorder, a cheap recorder, and they did an amateur recording of this and sent it to the news. And it made national news. Of course, this was Rodney King, and the Los Angeles riots would be something that would go down in history. Uh, Rodney was, went to, uh, was arrested, and then the four officers who were uh, accused of beating him uh, were tried. The trial was moved to a mostly all-white jury, jury, and uh, they, uh, in the beginning, acquitted him. And as a result, people went crazy in Los Angeles. And the riots of 1992 was just out of control. People lost their lives. A lot of damage was done and a lot of people injured. I think 63 people died. And of course, uh, we don't uh, believe that violence is the answer. Martin Luther King did not believe that either. Uh, but at the same time, this was something that had been building and building, and the tension between the people, the African-American community, and the, uh, the police officers was building up until it just kind of come to a, a climax there on that particular day. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. King had some more run-ins and never seemed to get his life on track. Uh, he ended up, they found him later in the bottom of his pool, dead. But the one thing that most all of us remember that are old enough to see that, and some of us have seen reruns of it, is his famous uh, speech in front of the audiences of cameras that day. And it went out nationwide. The riots were out of control, and he stands there, and I remember, uh, the way I remember it is he was kind of beat up and on his crutches. And he looks up to the cameras and says, can't we all just, what, get along? I imagine today that the Apostle Paul was sort of asking that same question to the Corinthian church. Can't you all just get along? And maybe we could ask that same question of the church in general, the United Methodist Church. It seems like every year we, we go to conference, or not every year, but uh, we have the, uh, not too much problem at the annual conference, but the general conference every four years. And that same battle every four years, fighting, infighting, all kinds of things going on. And so we might ask that question, and maybe God would ask that question, can't you, can't you all just get along? Well, that's what's going on here in this passage today in 1 Corinthians, and I uh, would like for you to, if you have your Bibles, to, to look there with me. The passage has been read, and we started this last week, and we're talking about this idea of somos del Señor, we belong to Christ. And why we have the translation and, and, and the Spanish and, and the English as well is because in our church, you know, there's pretty much all of us are, are the same nationality. I've been accused of being Mexican, but I'm really not. Uh, you know, I, uh, of 
according to my DA, I'm more ir Irish than anything. Uh, but anyway, that's okay. I do like a lot of hot food. I don't know if that means anything or not. I eat a lot of hot sauce and peppers and uh, maybe the, you know, if you trace it far enough back, uh, I suppose European American, you could make a case that I go back to Spain somehow. I'm sure that's part of that. And I'm not, I don't have a problem with that. But anyway, I want to say, I kind of digress a little bit there, uh, that where was I? Oh yeah. Talking about we belong to Christ. And, and the idea there is that in, in the church in general, the United Methodist Church, we are made up of a global church of people all different nationalities, all different kinds of ideas, and we're made up of Democrats and Republicans, and there's, you, you know, you put all these together, and you know, the mix can be uh, challenging to have unity, but that's what we're supposed to have. The Bible's idea is not for us all to think exactly alike in the sense that we, we all believe the same thing, but that we can learn to agree on the main thing. So if you look at the text there, you see that's what Paul beseeches. He said, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. And the word speak there is where we get the word, uh, it's really... Lego, like the old Lego my ego commercial, you know, it's that's how you pronounce it, Lego, which means to to speak, uh, to declare, and he's saying, I want you all to speak the same thing. That there be no divisions among you. And how is that possible? We live in a very divided world and a very divided church. How is it possible for us to speak the same thing? Is he uh, clueless of what's going on? No, I don't think so. He goes on to say that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. It's kind of like a puzzle coming together, or the pieces of, of a car that is assembled together, that they fit together. And that's the way the body of Christ is. It joins together when we have the same mind and the same purpose, the same goals. But he said, it's been declared among you, brethren, that there, from the household of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. And so the questions, the question this morning is kind of like the video, is who are you following? Who are we following? And Samantha did an excellent job of talking about that this morning, about the divisions that portrayed in the, in the church. And so he goes on to say some of those divisions. Some of you says, I am a Paul. Well, what's wrong with that? Paul is uh, writing the letter, and, and there were times that he said, you know, follow me as I follow Christ. <coughs> Paul was a good man. What's wrong with following Paul? And then he, he mentions Apollos and Cephas, which is Peter. In and of themselves, there's nothing wrong with having uh, even celebrities and ball teams that we support. And there's nothing wrong with having leaders and pastors that we like. We need people that we can follow. But the problem is that sometimes these can cause division. You say, well, who are we following? If I were to ask that question this morning, most everybody here would say, I'm sure, I'm following Christ. We're following Christ. Well, there was a group of people that even said that. Paul said, I of Cephas and I of Christ. That there were a group of people who said they were following Christ. And yet he seems to have a problem with that group as well. I mean, what could be wrong with giving allegiance to Christ and following Christ? And I think the idea is really, if you get to looking at the division here, you see that people are aligning themselves up with certain beliefs and personalities. And so the problem really is not in what we say. Paul isn't as interested in what we say as much as he is what we do. What we do affects how we live. And so if you look at these different uh, people here, he says, uh, first of all, Apollos. 
Apollos was an intellectual person. Uh, if you look, um, I think in Acts 18, um, I think it's around verse 4 or something like that. Uh, yeah, Acts 18, 24. We find that a certain man named Apollos was preaching and that uh, he was very eloquent. And so I think Apollos would represent sort of the intellectual people that we might follow. And then Cephas, which is Peter, would be the traditionalist. Peter walked with Christ. And he was a by the book kind of fella. And he would be the traditionalist of our day. And then the people that claim that they follow Christ, if you read a little bit about them, they were really what they would call libertines. They uh, were people who claimed freedom in Christ and they didn't really align themselves up with anybody and they took their freedom to an extreme to where they believe that just anything goes. Oh, we follow Christ so we are not bound by the law. We're not bound by anything. We're just going to live the way we want to. And so I find problems with each and every one of these groups. Those that would be the traditionalists that would say, you know, we're going to be hard-nosed about it and, you know, and they don't seem to care about other people. And then those that are the more progressive, I guess you would say, that say, you know, eh, nothing really matters. Anything goes. Just live any way you want to. That's the other extreme. I think of the situation here. And Paul said, is Christ divided? Was he, Paul, crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? None of these allegiance really work for the body of Christ. And yes, the question of who we're following should be that we're following Christ. But saying it and doing it are two different things. You see, there are a lot of people, <clears throat> a lot of churches who, who uh, if, you just, if you just believe certain things and say, I believe this and I believe that, it doesn't matter about it, the way you live, but if I just, you just have an intellectual agreement with them, and they'll give you a whole list of things, and sometimes they'll put it on the wall, we believe this, we believe that. And you go down that list, and there's a whole bunch of things that you have to agree, and some of those things might be uh, the premillennial return of Christ, and there's a whole bunch of things, some of those uh, things that are not maybe essential. And as long as you agree with this, then you're okay, according to that group. Not so much worried about the social aspect of the gospel. And then you have those who, uh, who are very strict in their beliefs, and they want to stick with that, and others who are more progressive and liberal. And, and Paul is saying, none of these are really right. None of these attitudes are right because it doesn't matter what you say. What matters is what you do and how you show Christ's love in the world. Because if you are quarreling and fighting and bickering among one another, that's not how you show the love of Christ. And he said, uh, I thank God that I baptized none of you. And he mentions a few people that he baptized. And then he has this senior moment where he couldn't remember anymore. I, you know, I just can't remember. For, I just baptized so many. Uh, by the way, I, I would think that it seems to me that Paul is, is putting the gospel, the preaching of the gospel and salvation above baptism here. And correct me if I'm wrong later, if you will. I'll be glad to talk to you about this. But if baptism was so essential... To salvation, do you think he would have downplayed it here? Do you think that he would have not said that I, you know, I want to baptize everybody I can? Instead, he's saying I, I haven't baptized that many people. That's just a side note there, but uh, you know, uh, he goes on to say, I don't, I don't know whether I baptize anybody else. Just these these few people. But Christ didn't send me to baptize. That's not my mission. That's not my goal. But to preach the gospel. Not with wisdoms of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of none effect. And so, he wants to preach God's Word to the people. 
and not make it none effect. And then he says, for the preaching of the cross to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. And the actual translation of that, that's the King James, is us that are being saved. And if your translation of your Bible that you have this morning says being saved, you have a correct translation there. Because the idea of it is not a one time thing. Salvation is an ongoing progressive thing that we are, con we are saved. Yes, we've been saved, we are saved, and we're being saved. That's the idea that Paul is portraying here. It continues, and it goes on. And so, Paul gives this whole scenario here of people that are following different th people and are, and are aligning themselves behind personalities, and the divisions that are caused. And he says, here is how you have unity. And I think we may have on the screen here, this, I believe what Paul is saying and what we need to do is, is that we need in order to have unity. Let's see if we have the first one up here. There we go. First of all, the cross be breaks down barriers. We need to understand that. And so what Paul is wanting us to do is not to focus on all those non-essential things, but to focus on the cross. And what Jesus did for us. And to really go back to the cross and be and live at the foot of the cross. Because the cross breaks down all barriers. At the foot of the cross, the Bible says that it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from. The Bible says that in, in heaven there will be people from all nationalities, all kinds of people. People that we have not uh, been around and people maybe that we have not known. People of different colors, different races, they'll all be in heaven. And the barriers are broken down. The Bible says that Christ broke down that wall of partition between us and God. But it also breaks down the barriers between us and each other. To where we're all one at the foot of the cross. We're all level at the foot of the cross. And so one of the ways that unity is brought by focusing on the cross is because we realize that we're all in need of Jesus. We all need Jesus. The second thing for the cross, we go to this second point here, is the cross is a symbol of self-denial. Jesus was preaching one time and He says, take up your cross and follow Me. And He wasn't talking about His cross because He hadn't been to the cross yet. But take up your cross. It's a personal cross. And in those days the cross was something that people understood because it was a death sentence and it was known in a way as uh, a very ugly thing. And I like what Paul says here. He says, to the world the cross and the preaching of the cross is foolishness. Even today I will go places and I'll hear people say things about people that would follow Jesus, a, a martyr Jesus. It doesn't make sense to the world to think about the fact that we are following someone who lived on the cross and lived and died on the cross. But Paul says to us who understand it and know Him, it's the power of God that leads to salvation. The cross is a beautiful thing to us. Now it's hard for us to, to really grasp what Paul is really saying here. But before this was written, most people didn't think of the cross as something beautiful. Most people didn't wear a cross around their neck. That didn't happen until really after Constantine became emperor and he uh, made Christianity legal and he had this vision and told people to begin wearing the cross and then it became a thing to do and I think it's a beautiful thing. Because to us it's something beautiful, it's not a, a shameful thing. But before this you know, Paul took the cross and made it something beautiful and, and uh, made us understand the beauty of it and the wonderful part of it, but before that people thought of it as a, a shameful thing. Nobody wanted to be identified with something 
as wicked and awful as a dying of a cross on a cross. And so it becomes something that symbolizes self-denial. And Jesus said, take up your cross. And he was saying that when you, when you begin to understand the cross and you, and you fall in love with the Jesus, that all of a sudden it's not about what I want so much. You begin to deny yourself some, some things in order to love one another. And so that's how unity comes when we, when we begin to live at the cross. And then number three, the third thing we have here is the cross. It really becomes the cross was a place that symbolized unconditional love. God's unconditional love. Because on the cross, that agape love, that love that God has for us, that when we did not deserve it, was on full display. And that cross, when we begin to live by that and live a cross-centered life, then we too will begin to love others the way we should love others. And these petty things that people fight over won't matter so much anymore. Now, don't get me wrong, I know there's times where, where we do have to take a stand and all that. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that a lot of the stuff that was going on in that day as well as many places today, that we're not focused where they need to be focused. And what happens is, as we get away from the gospel, and we get away from, from doing what we're supposed to be doing, and preaching the gospel, and we get caught up in all these factions. And Paul was saying, no, that's not what I want you to do. So who are we following today? Who are we following? I hope it's Christ. If we are, it should show forth in our lives. That we want to love people. We want to, we want to show that love. And I mentioned last week that it all came about when Paul talked about in chapter 13, 12 and 13, when he talked about the love chapter in chapter 13, that none of this really matters. All your gifts all your accomplishments, all you do, you claim you do for God doesn't really matter if you don't have love. Let's pray. As the musicians come. <clears throat> Lord, we know that sometimes we lose our focus. And sometimes we we fail to make the main thing the main thing. God, help us. Forgive us and free us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.